The hearing today is in the matter of CFI 106-2021 before Justice Sir Peter Gross and is being held by way of video conference. Any orders or direction made after or during the course of this hearing will be issued by the registry in Dubai on the judge's instructions. The claimant is represented by DLA Piper Middle East LLP. Lead counsel is Lord Marks QC. The defendants are represented by Taylor Wessing LLP. Lead counsel is Nicholas Carnell. Well, thank you, Beth, and thank you to the registry. We we can get underway. Um, I've read the skeletons, your additional notes, uh, and done my best to read. Uh, certainly a good deal of the bundle, uh, the e-bundle. Um, the reason I asked you various questions uh, was for this reason. Uh, I'm aware there is lurking uh, an application by the claimants to amend. And the thing, the matter which troubled me was if paying no regard to that application. I allowed the jurisdictional application. But then subsequently, Lord Marx having done some additional work on it, the amendment application succeeded. Um, there would be certain difficulties. Or at least procedurally, it would be a mess. Um, and that's what prompted the thinking that prompted my questions the other day. Um, th I just flag that you can proceed as you wish, um, but that that is what lay behind my concerns. Uh, we know there's an application to amend. Uh, it may or may not be in state that it's ready to proceed. Um, the point Mr. Carnell made in the final paragraph of his additional note may well have a lot of force, um, but sometime it's got to be heard. And I was troubled by the idea of deciding the two in isolation. So there are no mysteries that that's that's what prompted it. So how do we want to proceed? Um, well, well, your honor, so far as the so far as the, the, the defendants are concerned, um, our view is that we would prefer to proceed with our application today. Um, you, you said the application to amend was lurking. Well, it's, it's lurking in fairly plain sight. It has been um, addressed by my learned friend in his skeleton in some in, in some in some some detail. And I am going to respond to some of the points which he has made in the course of in the course of the submissions I'm about to make. Um, so it's it's certainly it's certainly our view that the the proposed amendments uh, suffer from exactly the same problems as his original claim, um, plus a few more, in fact. But um, in, 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 in our in our view, the suggestion which which my learned friend has made, which is that essentially um, we um, adjourn today and there are yet further submissions, um, is unlikely in our view to shed any light at all um, on the matter and is unlikely to be of any great assistance to you. Yes, yes. Lord Marks. Uh, can you still see or hear me? I had a strange yeah. moment here. Um, yeah, no, I, can, I can see you both. Thank Your Honour, you. thank you. Um, our position is that um, the amendment application um, flags up uh, an issue which um, Your Honour's rightly picked up on. Uh, we say that allowing the amendment uh, would act add causes of action in tort uh, and under Articles 84 and uh, 162 of the Commercial Companies Law. We say that the second defendant is in any event a necessary and proper party to these proceedings for the reasons that I've set out in detail uh, in my skeleton. 
uh, and that in order to resolve all matters uh, in dispute, you would need to look at the case uh, as amended. Uh, and I don't propose now to rehearse the arguments on the amendment, though they emerge fairly clearly from, uh, from my skeleton argument. Uh, we were quite clear that the amendment application could be heard today and ought to be heard today. Unfortunately, the um, defendants declined the invitation to have them heard together today, saying that they were not ready and they wished to um, prepare opposition to the amendment application. The registry supported that position and said the amendment application would um, proceed in the normal course uh, with evidence on both sides. Uh, our position is that uh, the defendant's refusal to have them heard today was unfortunate uh, and we go so far as to say unreasonable. Nevertheless, you're, you're left with the position that allowing the amendment would add causes of action. And if you'd previously allowed the jurisdictional application, that would put us in a procedural bind of uh, some very real difficulty. Uh, that is exactly the course that um, Mr. Carnell and defendant's team uh, expect you to adopt. Uh, we say that is entirely unjust because if it is right that there should be an amendment allowed to add the additional causes of action uh, as a secondary case, and I make no, um, I don't hide from the fact that our primary case is that the second defendant is liable in breach of contract personally. Uh, for the reasons that I set out in my skeleton, but our secondary case would add the causes of action in tort and the statutory causes of action uh, under the two articles of the um, commercial companies law. That leaves you with the with three courses which I've put in my uh, brief note. Uh, either you dismiss the just jurisdictional challenge on the basis that the court can determine it uh, now in the court's favour. And you can do that either on the basis that the claim as unamended uh, in breach of contract shows that the second defendant is a necessary and proper party to the claim for that breach of contract. Or on the alternative basis, which we say is equally valid and acknowledges, as your honour just has, the reality that there is an amendment application. And says that the court must take into account that there's an outstanding amendment application, which is going to have to be determined as a matter of substance. It cannot sensibly be determined as a matter of substance after the jurisdictional challenge is allowed because the court would have decided it had no, no jurisdiction over the uh, second defendant. Uh, and therefore we say that since that issue needs to be resolved, then on the basis that the second defendant is a necessary and proper party, it's right to take that amendment application into account. Uh, and the, that uh, marries in with my first um, preliminary point uh, in my skeleton, that the application to amend is an application in the course of the proceedings. And that you're entitled now to accept jurisdiction. And then if the application to amend fails, so then it fails. What you cannot do, we say, is allow the jurisdictional challenge because that would be to, to do a profound injustice to the claimant who has a, a case of breach of contract, but also an application to amend to add um, additional causes of action. Uh, declining the jurisdiction in the face of that amendment application would we say uh, lead to uh, the prospect of an appeal, because we say that would be unjust. It would lead on the uh, defendant's position, which we say is untenable, to the claimant having to issue a fresh claim. And quite apart from the fact that that would fly in the face of the decision on jurisdiction already made on this hypothesis, that would be waste for the resources and time, uh, and therefore unjust. And it has the additional problem that it would afford the second defendant an extra limitation defense in tort, which is a three year uh, limitation period from the time when the claimant becomes aware of the uh, claim and the identity of the uh, defendant. Uh, when 
in the generality because the claim in tort arises out of the same facts as the claim in breach of contract. Uh, the existing date of issue of the claim would be the proper date for the purposes of the limitation oh. uh, period of the application. So we say that would be uh, very unjust. So that the our primary course is that you have to uh, refuse the jurisdiction application. And if for any reason you were not to do that, then it would have to be adjourned uh, to uh, to join the amendment application. Well, I'll tell you where I am, and then Mr. Carnell, or you can add what you like. Um, I'm not expressing views on the merits of either the jurisdiction application or the application to the end. Um, you'll appreciate that, but I just say that so nobody misunderstands it. Um, we'll come to that at some point. Uh, the thing which troubles me, Mr. Carnell, is not hearing the two together. Having said that, I'm, I was a little little concerned when Lord Marx said you'd need evidence on both sides when dealing with the application to amend. I'm not sure about that. Um, but what I would need uh, would be further submissions, firstly from the claimant, because at the moment there is force in Mr. Carnell's repast um, that the claimant is toying with the causes of action. There are lots of causes of action, but do they really apply? Um, and you might need to say rather more about why there's a tort here when ordinarily there is separate corporate personality. And secondly, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying uh, I, I'd need persuasion. And the second point which I would need help on uh, is whether you are saying there is, you, you refer uh, Lord Marx to the statutory cause of action. Well, you're going to have to show me what a pleading would look like on that. I know in theory, you don't have to produce a pleading while jurisdiction is an issue, but I'd want to see what is effectively a case of fraud would look like if you're actually going to run it. Um, and what had gone through my mind, I, I, I deeply dislike adjournments, but sometimes one's in a bit of a muddle if one doesn't, and this may, may I stress, be one of them. One thought was to direct that the claimants spell out their adjournment application by pleading in a further skeleton. Thereafter, the defendants have a chance to respond by skeleton to that. Uh, and then we hear both applications together. So the jurisdiction application would not be dismissed today on any view. Um, but I would be ruling on both jurisdiction and um, and and the uh, adjournment application. So say, for instance, at that point, the claimant then lost the adjournment application. That may lead to one conclusion. If, on the other hand, the claimant succeeded in the adjourn in the amendment application, um, that might lead to another conclusion. Um, and Mr. Carnell can also think about whether having seen your amendment application, he wants to have a go at striking you out. It's a matter for him entirely. Well, I'm not, not saying it's a good cause, a bad cause or no cause, but it's something he'd need to think about. And of course, that is um, conceptually different from no jurisdiction. Um, but all this is, is shadow boxing until we've actually seen what the real colour of the amendment application. Mr. Carnell, that would lead, irritatingly from your point of view, to an adjournment today, but might in the long run produce at least a neater outcome. The one course I'm not attracted to is, for example, allowing jurisdiction, the jurisdiction application, leaving Lord Marx to have to launch a fresh claim which just seems a very wasteful course of action. We can course of action. We can resolve costs in due course, but not today. Mr. Cornell, do you want to respond to that? Um, only very, only very briefly, Your Honour. Um, 
I I would frankly associate myself with 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 everything that everything that you say. Um, our concern with this proposed amendment yeah. is, our, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Our concern. I, with, I, with I, I might even agree. Well, our concern with this proposed amendment was that we were, we were, we were, we were struggling essentially to see how it made it made out um, an arguable tortious case against. Uh, D2, either un, on the, the tortious interference basis, or um, on the the on, on the basis of the statutory obligations under Articles 84 and 162, um, and you put your finger on what I think is a is is a very very important point, which is, yes, RDC, and I think it's 16.2, says that pen, pending. Um, resolution of a jurisdictional application, a party need not plead. It doesn't say must not plead. And th the difficulty, and this is something that we've set out in our uh, pleadings, but uh, sorry, in our skeleton at some length, is that we are we are in genuine difficulties in understanding exactly what the claimants claim against D2 really comprises. There is a there is there is um, a mixed bag of allegations made made against D two, um, and those may or those may or may not um, have ha have have either any factual substance or um, actually display, disclose a cause of action. So. It, 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 I would very much associate myself with the idea that um, Lord Marx should, if I can use a horrible expression, put his money where his mouth is and set out what his case, set out what his case against D2 is. Um, and I don't want to be too prescriptive, but he, he should do so in a way that says this is our, this is our definitive case. And this is, uh, and, and this is, this is, this is where, this is where we stand. Now, it may be, um, and Lord Marx is an extraordinarily skillful member of the bar, that he does this in a way that causes us to be entirely persuaded. Um, that would be a step forward. So, um, yes, I, I, I like adjournments no more than you do, um, but I do take, I do take, I do take your point. So that may be, that may be the way that we have to go. In fact, I think it probably is. Well, thank you very much. It's extremely helpful. Lord Marx, I'm attracted to the following course. We would, I'm not putting it in words of an order as yet. Um, the, the registry is, is on the line and I will make it clear in a moment once, once we've finished. My instinct sort of foreshadowed in, in the note I sent the other day, is we need to deal with both applications together. To do that, we need to adjourn this application. Next, we need you, I'm not going to put it the way Mr. Carnell did, but we do need you to spell out unequivocally what the proposed causes of action against D2 are. Uh, so far as they're simply in contract, you know the mountains you face, um, but you you seek to deal with that in tort and you seek to deal with that by way of uh, Article 84 and the other statutory claims. Speaking for myself, I need you to spell them out. Um, I would be helped by seeing what a pleading would look like. Uh, I'm not ordering it. If you want to do it by a skeleton, that's fine. Um, but the next hearing will be the definitive hearing, so uh, we need to see just what a claim against D2 would look like. You might, of course, persuade Mr. Carnell, but the important point is whether you persuade me. <laughs> and um, so, so there's a premium on explaining just how you are going to proceed against D2. When you've done that, we can think about timetabling in a minute. 
then Mr. Carnell must have a chance to respond to that. And then we can see where we are, and he also needs to think, or may wish to think, about a, a strikeout application in the alternative, whilst no doubt preserving his jurisdiction point. I'm sure the rules would permit him not to waive the jurisdiction point, just so we can actually deal with, with the matter in the round. Or at least I hope the rules do that. Um, now, that seems to me to make sense. I make no decision on the jurisdiction application today. I reserve all questions of costs. Uh, and the regret is that it will take longer. If, if we proceeded in that fashion, Lord Marks, how long would you need to do what I've asked? We're almost given a fairly strong indication that you'd want to see something in the form of a draft pleading. Yes. Uh, and for that, I might need three weeks. OK. And then, Mr. Uh, I mean, on that point, um, yeah. Your Honour mentioned in uh, your um, indication that, uh, that, yeah, the sorry, lack of evidence I... was, that the lack of evidence on both sides was something which had been raised by me, but that you weren't sure about the requirement for evidence. The point that I made about the requirement for evidence is that the, def the defendants were saying in their submission to the registry as to why uh, the amendment application couldn't be heard together with the jurisdictional application today, that there was a requirement for evidence. We don't accept that. Uh, our position uh, has been and will on questions of costs, notwithstanding what happens now, be that we could make out the causes of action on the basis of the um, initial reply to the jurisdictional challenge, which set out broadly the facts upon which we rely and was attested by a statement of truth from Mr. McKenzie. That said, I understand your Honour's position, and it, it seems to me that it is overwhelmingly sensible that the two applications be heard for, together. Uh, I always took that view and we did at the outset, which was why we suggested they should be heard together. Uh, there was no suggestion from the German on the other side, there was just a suggestion that the amendment application couldn't be heard now. Uh, we set out in our response, brief responses to your questions, the courses we saw in the light of events which had happened, one of which was an adjournment to enable yes. uh, the two applications to be heard together. Uh, and uh, Your Honour has indicated first that you would be helped by that and you'll be hearing the case. And secondly, that you would be helped by something of the order of a draft pleading uh, and has indicated that um, to, to Mr. Carnell that he might like to consider a strikeout application. If he wants to consider a strikeout application, I can see that it would be very helpful to have a draft pleading. I take his point, it's actually um, RDC 12.6, that says that you don't normally serve a pleading before uh, a jurisdictional application is determined. Uh, and I take his point that that says does not need to serve an application. I, I've always taken it that that was, that was the form that where there wasn't a, a pleading before the jurisdictional application. Of course, in the Nest Investments case, there was a long pleading because that was a case of adding a party after yeah. the particulars of payment being served. This is a different case. but. Um, it seems to me that given your indication, it would be best for us, uh, provisionally it seems that it would be best for us to accede to the course you've suggested. But I would like a moment to take instructions if that would be um, acceptable. Um, just, of course it is. Um, in the sense of a pleading, I mean, it's really, in that sense, it's up to you to take your own course. Um, but you'd, you'd end up, I think, I don't think, have, I've read your re jurisdictional reply and my remarks were made having read them, having read that. So you will need to develop that further. Um, of course, you'll do that by a skeleton argument, but especially with regard to the statutory causes of action which go to fraud, um, one would need to see the colour of it and to know that you're actually prepared to run that. Yes. Uh, it's it's very easy to talk about statutory causes of action, but under underlying that is a plea of fraud. 
uh, and you know the score as well as I do. And and so no, no, certainly I do, and I wouldn't have um, filed the skeleton argument and effectively alleging fraud if I hadn't been prepared to yeah. prove and satisfy that the facts justify that. Then then the we would we'll, we'll, right justify that. We'll, we'll we'll need to see what it looks like, which you may find easier to do by pleading than any other um, any any other way. Um, do you want a moment or two to take instructions? Your Honour, if I could, um, I don't know whether the best way to deal with that is for us to go offline for a moment or simply mute and I will make a telephone call. Well, Mr Carnell, do you want to add anything before Lord Marks gets instructions? Uh, uh, really, really only, only this. Um, it would be helpful to see a draft pleading. Um, there is at the moment um, an allegation of fraud. There are allegations of criminal behaviour. There is a great deal. There is a, there is a, there is a great deal of, 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 of um, rather impassioned rhetoric in, in the skeleton that's been put put forward. We we would like to see the case that is being put against us. And we'd like to see it put in a manner that we can properly respond to, um, which is which is not which is not the case of, not the case at the moment. Our reason for objecting to dealing with them, with essentially everything in this hearing was that these th these amendments were produced very late, um, and as we currently see them, it's impossible for the Def either defendant to understand exactly the case that is being advanced against it. Now, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to to, um, to 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 overplay my 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 hand in this, um, but it's going to be helpful to see exactly what the claimant says in this in this regard, uh, and it would be helpful to see that in the form of a of of a draft pleading on which we can take instructions and to which we can we, we can sensibly reply in due in due course. Um, perhaps just for, the com for completeness, if Lord Marx says it's going to take three weeks, that's absolutely fine. Uh, as far as Dubai is concerned, that is likely to take us up to or very close to the to the the Eid break. Uh, I'm not usually in the habit of volunteering additional time, but were he to need four weeks, um, that would be of no that would be of no consequence to us because um, we would probably uh, well I am away that week anyway, and I suspect quite a lot of people in Dubai are. So Lord Marx would get four weeks from today, and how long would you want to respond? Um, well, it rather depends on what he's what, what he has to say, but I suspect this. I, if I ask for the same, I don't think I, I I don't think that would that would be objected to. Okay, I'm just looking ahead. So he gets four weeks, you get four weeks. We're into August, and then each each of you will want to say something in response rather quickly, but we can do sort of one week for that. So we will be looking for a hearing sometime from September. Is that right? I think that's likely to that's likely to be I mean, right. Being realistic, I'd, I'd like to get it on as quickly as possible. I mean, ideally, I'd like to get it on next week, but um, in the real world, that's not going to happen. So one would be looking somewhere like September to try and get the hearing on. Um, and the length of hearing would be what? Same as today? Maybe I would think so. I would think so. May even be shorter if 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 we if we have a slightly clearer idea as to as to what the issues are. But two hours would be sensible. Well, you today was done for three. Ah, right. my mistake. Um, um, I can never remember the maximum Dubai court day, but I think it's probably four, which is something we could certainly work on. I'd like to keep it to one day, but if need be, sitting where I am, morning and then a break and then afternoon, 
if that if that's convenient for those in Dubai, where I'm conscious the result would be a later finish. That's fine. Okay, I think when we hear it all together, it's four hours myself. Right, unless, of course, uh, uh, we re all reach agreement. Marks, anything else, or is this the time no, to take just, instructions? Just two, two small points before I take instructions. I agree four hours would be sensible because we'd be hearing both applications and um, possibly looking at um, uh, in more detail at the way the case is put. Um, my concern about a joint pleading, I'll just canvas with you, about a, a draft pleading, is I see no difficulty at all about producing a draft pleading that deals with that section of the pleading that says why we say D2 is liable. I have much more concern about going into all the detail of the contract, which would also be included in the draft pleading. Uh, and I, I'd like to make that clear because it seems to me that that may involve draft witness evidence and so forth, which... Um, no, I, let, me, let me interrupt you, forgive me. What I'm interested in is, is what a draft pleading making D2 liable would look like. Yes. Not, not, the, not the full works, as it were. Yes. Well, On why there's contractual liability against D1, for instance. Yes. If, yeah, if I'm I... Told, um, doesn't need that. Yes, if I take instructions on that basis, because that's what I can see as, as feasible within the time. Very good. Um, I will mute myself and shut down my camera temporarily, but it means I can hear you. So if you can do that and then between you and the registry electronically shout at me, uh, I'll, I'll come back online. Yes. Uh, right. I will mute and turn my camera off and deal with this by telephone. So, okay, I'm yeah. I, I'm here, but going going dark as it were. Thank you. Hello, this is Lord Marks here. I'm um, back and have taken instructions. And if we can reassemble, that would be great. I'm here. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, so am I. Good. Uh, uh, is the registry as well? I think everybody's here. Yes. Is the registry, is, is the registry here? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Maita. Um Right. Anything you wish to add? Um, well, only this, that I've had an opportunity to take instructions and my instructing solicitors are um, uh, agreeable to the pr the course proposed uh, and to the timetable. So um, you, you have all our agreement. <laughs> there is a danger of agreement breaking out. Um, <laughs> well, it, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> let's see. OK, I'm saying what follows for you both and for the registry. Maita, can you in due course draw this up formally and show it to me in draft? Certainly, Judge. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to give reasons. You know what my thinking is. The directions would be along the following lines, which will in due course be formalized by the registry. One, I'm going to adjourn today's application, the jurisdiction application. Two, uh, if the claimants are minded to pursue their amendment application, they must one, produce a skeleton dealing fully with it, uh, and little two, a draft pleading uh, as to why D2 is personally liable, as to the basis upon which D2 might be personally liable uh, within four weeks of today. In parenthesis, um, that takes us to the 14th July. Big, so one big one was adjournment, big two was claimants to do what I've just said. Big three, defendants to respond, in parenthesis, including consideration of whether to make a strikeout application. Mr. Carnell, you obviously aren't, I'm not obliging you to make one, just, just for flagging that it's something uh, that no doubt you will consider. You may or may not then proceed with it. That's a matter no, for you. Noted, noted Your Honour. Uh, but 
the the ruling is defendants to respond within four weeks thereafter. So that on my calculation takes us to the 11th August. Big four, any further submissions, authorities, etc., to be delivered and all uploaded onto the e-bundle within two weeks thereafter, which takes us to the 25th of August. Big five, the refixed hearing should be refixed for four hours. Uh, I'll talk to the registry about what time I can start here, but it's, it's likely to be something like two hours, two and a half hours, then a break and then whatever's left uh, thereafter. So we can try and do it in one day. Uh, so hearing to be fixed for four hours, not before the 5th of September, which just gives a margin uh, in case uh, we hit any hiccups, but I'd really now like to proceed and get this on. Uh, and big six cost reserved. Have I omitted anything from those directions? Uh, you haven't, Your Honour. There is only there is one small consequential oh. matter, which yes. is that the following the um, claimant's application to amend, we would in the ordinary course of events be required to respond to them tomorrow. I don't know that this needs to go into an order, but it it will it will be understood that we we would not we we would not be doing doing that. Oh right. So the registry should record that this order supersedes um, any previous order about because the the amendment application was to be dealt with on paper tomorrow, was it? Well, we were to respond to the to, to the amendment application tomorrow. OK, how shall we frame it? So let's make it big seven so I don't have to renumber. Can I suggest that the, um, the time for the um, defendant's response to the amendment application, this is in uh, N3. Yes. Be extended until four weeks after the um, claimant skeleton and draft pleading. Uh, superseding, yes, superseding any previous order, the time, the time for D's to respond to C's application to amend is four weeks after. Is is that same four week period? Yeah. Four weeks after. Uh, what shall we call it? Four weeks after. Seize production of skeleton and any draft pleading. Yeah. Yes. To the registry is are those points clear enough for you to draw up something? Yes, Judge. OK, if, if you are kind enough, Martha, to send it to me in draft just so I can run my eye over it, um, I can then approve it and it can become a formal order. But Time will start running from today. Certainly. So, uh, Lord Marx, um, even even if it takes till tomorrow or something before the the formal order gets back to you, it's it's twenty eight days from today. Good. It's, 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 good. What have I missed? Is there anything else? I think nothing I can think of. Apart no, from thank you for the thought you've given to it. Well, no, thank you both. Um, I'm, I'm only sorry we can't proceed right now, but uh, I, I think the better course is the one we've we've settled upon. Agreed. Thank very you. good. Thank you all very much. And my thanks to the registry for the arrangements. I look forward to hearing from Maitha. Thank you and thank you, Maitha. Thank you. Good thank afternoon, you. everybody. Look forward to seeing you in due course. Thank yes, you. Thank you.